you listen to the radio, occasionally you will hear the Dave Ramsey show. And if you hear the Dave Ramsey show, it's all about people getting out of debt and things like that. And every now and then, people will call in and they'll say, Dave, we followed your advice. And now, and what do they always yell? We're debt free, right? And, and it's a great big deal. And, and people talk about the sacrifices that they have to make. Maybe some of you have done this. I know in, in times of our lives where we've had debt, I hate debt. And I, I will aggressively, I will put everything that we can on hold. We don't buy anything new unless we have to. And, and we got to get rid of debt. Because the Bible says the borrower is a slave to the lender. It changes the relationship. And so uh, you might, maybe you've gone through that and you said, you know what? We'd like to maybe go on a vacation as a family this year, but we're going to scale it back. We'd like to, we want to get the car paid off or the house paid off or whatever. We're willing to sacrifice, but what? There has to be a trade-off. And and sometimes that trade-off is years ahead. Sometimes it's decades in the future, the trade-off. That if the money that you're now spending on debt, if you listen to Dave Ramsey and he says, man, if you get out of debt, then you can put, invest that money and look at how it'll grow through compounded interest. And it not only will help your finances now, but it's going to help your finances way down the road somewhere. And so you have to have this, this long view of things that says, okay, I'm not going to eat at McDonald's. And he, he always jokes about people eating fish sticks and, and uh, canned beans and cornbread and really cheap meals, uh, spaghetti and, and, and dollar uh, prego sauce that you put on it. Because we're willing to sacrifice if we know that there's a reward, that there's a payoff. And one of the things I think nowadays that's happening is is younger generations are receiving things faster and faster and faster, and there's not that patience to kind of wait for the the trade-off at the end. Some of you that are older than I am, you you were raised that way, and you have that that understanding that no, good things come to those who wait. We want it right now. We want the the payoff to be right now. And, And so if we look at the long view and we say there's a, there's a payoff coming, then I'm willing to sacrifice in the here and now. In a nutshell, that's kind of what a lot of the book of Hebrews is about. It's about saying there, there's this eternal payoff, and it's going to affect your life now. You're probably going to do without. Things may not be as good as, as maybe you think they could be in the here and now, but there's a, there's a trade-off. And you have to be willing to look with eyes of faith out ahead, out past your problems right now, out past the circumstances right now, and look ahead and say, I may not get it in this life, but I'm gonna, it's guaranteed in the life to come. And that's a big message, an overarching message to the book of Hebrews. We're calling this dead men walking by faith because all these people died, the scripture says. Some of them didn't realize in this life. They didn't see the return on investment in this life. They've seen the return on the investment now once they've crossed over to the other side. Dead dead men walking by faith. and These are ordinary people like you and me who lived extraordinary lives because their faith was in an extraordinary God. And Think of it this way. It's not the size of your faith. You may just have a little bit of faith. It's the source of your faith that matters the most, not the size of your faith. It's better to have a little bit of faith on thick ice than a whole lot of faith on thin ice. The source of the faith matters more than the size of the faith. And so Hebrews chapter 11, it's, just, it's all about faith. And we're going to dive right in. 11 verse 1 says this, Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It's the evidence of things we can't see. I can't see debt-free, but I'm eating spaghetti or fish sticks now. But I know it's coming. There's a reward for it. It's not tangible. I can't hold it right now. And and, and spiritually, we're saying, I know that there's the reward of living for God, the reward that I'm going to have in heaven, and I can't see it and I can't touch it right now, but there's evidence to it. And my faith is that evidence. There are questions that can't be answered with a calculator or a science book. What about the eternal? What about our purpose in life? Not everything can be answered through mathematics and science. There's this other part of us, the soul, that's eternal and understands that there's something bigger than just what's happening right here. 
faith shows us the reality of what we hope for. It's the evidence of things we can't see. And now he's going to go right in and start talking about some of the ancient people who lived by faith who are examples for you and me today. And he's writing to a bunch of people who are getting beat up because of their faith. Some of them have been disowned by their families, lost out on their inheritance. We saw that in the previous chapter. Some were being put in prison. They were being persecuted not only by the Jewish people, but by the Roman government as well. And so Christians in the first century really had it rough. And they had to have some way of saying, okay, it's, if I endure this, there's got to be a reward because otherwise it's not worth enduring this. Through faith, he says, the people in days of old, speaking of the people that we would read about in the Old Testament, those first 39 books of the Bible, people like Moses or Abraham, maybe you've heard of. Through their faith, the people in days of old earned a good reputation or a good testimony. And now he begins at creation. And it's important. This is very interesting that, that the author of Hebrews, I, I, if I say Paul, it's because I think it's Paul. Some people think it's a guy named Apollos. Um, whoever was the author definitely spent time in jail for being a Christian because he talks about his chains, which meant his, his imprisonment. And he had a mastery knowledge of the Old Testament, whoever wrote it. I'm, so if I say Paul and you believe it's Apollos, that's okay. I, we'll both get to go to heaven. That, wasn't, that won't matter. Okay. So the writer here, he begins with creation. This is very interesting. So, so God says this about himself. I am the alpha and the omega. Okay, so those are the, that's like the A and the Z. It's the, it's the first and last letter of the Greek alphabet. I am the alpha. I am also the omega. I'm the beginning and the end. So he's both. If God is not alpha, he is not you see the foundation that's being laid here. If God is not the beginning, then it's not the ending. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. So if we're going to have this long view of things, we have to trust in that this is a God who has established the world, the universe, the order of things, and He is over the universe, and He will be ultimately the judge of all things. The judge that gives rewards, the judge that gives punishments at the end. By faith, it says... We understand that the entire universe was formed at God's command. That what we see now did not come from anything that had been seen. So, there are two schools of thought in the world today, generally. Two schools of thought. One is, there is an intelligent designer slash creator slash God that created everything. And the other side is, there is a series of cosmic accidents that resulted in us being here today. So that's kind of the two, uh, in a nutshell, those are the two views. Obviously, the biblical view is, no, there is an intelligent designer, God slash creator, who made everything and set up the order. He's the alpha, he's the omega, he's the beginning and the ending. How do we understand that? It says we understand that by what? By faith. Why is it that I understand that by faith? Because I wasn't there when the universe was formed. And neither were you, and neither was anybody else. Now, the other side is also true. So if, if, if this was being written from an evolutionary, secular standpoint, an honest person would have to say, by faith, I believe that we're the result of a com cosmic accident. Why? Because they weren't there either. Both sides are accepting this by faith. And so what you have to do as an individual is look at the evidence and say, do I believe things are in, an, in a natural order but created by a creator? Or do I believe that things are a, a series of random chaotic accidents that resulted in us being here today? And you have to weigh that out. I believe that there's very strong evidence that there is an intelligent designer slash creator slash God and that God created and made everything out of nothing, as the verse says. And I think the evidence points in that direction. I'm not a great apologeticist. For, for those things. I have a dear friend who has a PhD in, and he's, he's a professor of organic chemistry at a large state university and his brain's like this big. I read the first paragraph of his dissertation. I don't know, and I, I think I'm pretty smart. I don't know if I understood a word of it. And, and Mike, he was raised uh, completely outside of church, never went to church as a kid, nothing like that. 
And so he was only raised from one perspective, and it was his pursuit in science that led him to realize there is order and there's, and the evidence, he wasn't there, but the evidence shifted his thinking to say, there had to be an intelligent designer. There's a saying that goes like this, for there to be information, there must be causation. You should think that through. For there to be information, there must be causation. So, and again, I'm, I'm not going to play scientist up here. I did stay at a Holiday Inn last night. Um, <laughs> one cell is passing on information to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. Where did the information come from? I, I'm not talking about how did the proteins get organized and how did they get energized. I'm saying where did the information come from? Because information means there must be causation. There had to be a cause of that information. And that, that, that's one evidence I, I throw out there. A belief in a creator God is not a blind faith. And I think we must be careful in the culture in which we live to hear, as they say, the sound of one hand clapping. If you only hear one side, guess what? There's another side. <laughs> There are scholarly people on both sides of this debate, but right now we're only hearing this, aren't we? You're only allowed to even say that there's one side. I believe the evidence is there, that there is a creator God. It's not a blind faith. It's not a faith that opposes science. It's actually a faith that emboldens and strengthens what I believe. By faith, the scripture says, we understand that the entire universe was formed at God's command that what we see now did not come from anything that has been seen. And that's exactly how the Bible describes the creation of the world, that God speaks it into existence. The Latin term is ex nihilo, out of nothing, God speaks. That God is the source of creation. The New Testament begins the same way as the Old Testament. The Old Testament starts with, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The New Testament begins uh, with John writing, in the beginning, well, I mean, I know Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but I'm saying the Gospels begin with, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Because for Him to be the Omega, He has to be the Alpha. For Him to be the End, He has to be the Beginning. Good paying attention, awesome. <laughs> Extra points right there. Okay? So, yeah, you can't be the End and not be the beginning. Okay, when we speak of God, he's got to be alpha, omega, beginning, and the ending. That's really important, and it's foundational. And I felt like we needed to spend some time on that this morning because if I'm going to trust in the long view, what am I trusting? I'm trusting in a God who got it started. And because he's powerful over creation, he has the authority to be the judge at the end. And, and as, the, as Job says, will not the judge of all the earth do what is right? As we continue very quickly this morning, he moves from creation right into the first example of a person living by faith. And if you went to Sunday school as a kid, you're going to know the story of Cain and Abel. If you didn't go to Sunday school, this is just going to sound like, man, this is crazy. This is far out there. So, uh, but here we go. The story of Cain and Abel. That's the first example that he gives of somebody who was righteous. And I don't want to spend so much time dealing with the story. We're going to read it. But I, I want to look at the application of that story and why he begins with creation and then immediately, this author immediately moves into the story of Cain and Abel first. It's interesting that the, he does not begin with Adam, but begins the, the first of God's creation, but he begins with Adam's son, Abel. It was by faith, the scripture says, that'll be the next one. It was by faith that Abel brought a more acceptable offering to God than Cain did. Abel's offering gave evidence that he was a righteous man, and God showed his approval of his gifts. Although Abel is long dead, he still speaks to us by his example of faith. So, and we're going to go back and look at this story. If you remember from last week, one of the advice that we were given was, anytime you see a reference to the Old Testament, go back and look at what that story is about. So we're just going to read that story really quickly. We're going to make some application to it. So it was by faith that Abel, you're going to see those words come through. It was by faith that, and then we're going to have all these different examples through the next couple weeks as we look at Hebrews 11. He starts with Abel, and it's really important that he starts with Abel to people who were kind of suffering and getting beat up for their faith. So, what's the story of Abel back in Genesis? Uh, Genesis chapter 4, I believe. Let me get back there. I'll just read it from here. 
Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. Now Adam had sexual relations with his wife Eve, and she became pregnant, and she gave birth to Cain, and, and she said, the Lord's, with the Lord's help, I have produced a man. Now, this is in response. She's thinking that she is bearing the Messiah, because God had promised them after they sinned that she would bring, have a son, or there would be a, a, a child born who would crush the head of the serpent, and, and the serpent would bruise his heel. And she's thinking, well, that was fast. We sinned, and God fixes it in one generation. Awesome. Not the case. When she gave birth to Cain, she said, With the Lord's help, I have produced a man. Later she gave birth to his brother and named him Abel. When they grew up, Abel became a shepherd, while Cain cultivated the ground. So we got a shepherd, we got a farmer, an agricultural farmer. And when it was time for the harvest, Cain presented, it says, some of his crops as a gift to the Lord. Abel also brought a gift, the best of the firstborn lambs from his flock. The Lord accepted Abel and his gift, but he did not accept Cain and his gift. This made Cain very angry, and he looked dejected. Now, there's a lot about this story that we don't know. Um, we don't know, was there some type of a requirement that God had stipulated? So there are two schools of thought on this story. One is, there's a passage in the Bible that says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So some scholars have looked at this and said... Abel's sacrifice did not involve the shedding of blood, therefore there was no remission of sin. And that's, that's plausible. Other scholars look at it and say, no, the problem here is that Abel brought of the very best that he had as a sacrifice to the Lord. In appreciation to the Lord, he brought the very best of the first fruits of his flock. And Cain, it says, just brought some. It doesn't say Cain brought of the best or Cain brought of the first part of his harvest. It says he just brought some. And so either way, whatever... God was pleased with Abel's sacrifice, not pleased with Cain's sacrifice. And this made Cain upset, and he looked dejected, as it says. All right, continuing on. Why are you so angry, the Lord asked Cain? Why do you look so dejected? You would be accepted if you did what was right, but you refuse to do what is right. Then watch out. Sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you. But you must subdue it and be its master. One day, Cain suggested to his brother, let's go out into the fields. This gives the idea that this action that's about to take place is premeditated. And while they were out in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. As far as we know, this is the first human death. It's the death of Abel. Afterward, the Lord asked Cain, where is your brother? Where is Abel? And can you imagine how this breaks the heart of God? He's created mankind in his image to bear his image. Three chapters earlier, it says everything is great, it's awesome. God says it is good, it is good. He creates mankind and says it's very good. I've made them in my likeness to bear my image. Now they've sinned and they're already killing each other. Didn't take long. Where's your brother? I don't know, he said, because that's what all children say when they get in trouble. Cain responded, am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground, telling us that he buried his brother. He's covering up his sin. He's not repenting. He's covering it. Now you are cursed, banished from the ground, which has swallowed up your brother's blood. No longer will the ground yield your crops for you, no matter how hard you work, for from now on you will be homeless wanderer on the earth. Cain replied to the Lord, my punishment is too great for me to bear. Because he's still thinking about himself, not the person that he killed. You have banished me from the land and from your presence and have made me a homeless wanderer. Anyone who finds me will kill me. Which we're all thinking, yeah, that's what they should do. Because you're a murderer. But the Lord in his mercy. No, the Lord replied, I will give a sevenfold punishment to anyone who kills you. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain to warn anyone who might try to kill him. So Cain left the Lord's presence and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. What in the world do we get out of this one? Okay. What was Abel known for? Only one thing. He did what was right, and he tried to please the Lord. And what happened? He got killed. Yeah. He got killed. And this writer says... To these people who are struggling, the church is just beginning and people are starting to follow Jesus and follow the example of Jesus. They're getting thrown in jail. They're getting their stuff taken away. They're losing their inheritances. Some of them are being put to death. 
By this time, there have already been many martyrs in the church, people who died because of their faith, because of their testimony that they had seen and believed in the risen Christ. So Paul's saying, hey, you might die. You might live righteously and die an unjust death. But God's keeping track. He's not only the beginning, he is the end. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's, going, he's keeping track. And you may live righteously. Now, this is a radically different message than is getting taught in a lot of places, which says, if you just have enough faith and you just believe enough and you just do enough, then all of your life will be a blessing. And, and that's just not what the Bible teaches. Sometimes we experience the blessings of following God in this life. That, that really is true. If you're obedient to the Lord, you read the book of Proverbs, and and you follow those principles in your life, and you live a wise life, a lot of times in this life, you will reap the benefits of living wisely. However, you might be like Abel. And you might live righteously, and your life might be snuffed out in an unjust way. And God is still on the throne, and He's still going to do justice by you and by himself for all of eternity. And that's why he starts with that. Because the rest of the people we're going to read about in, this, in, in the book of uh, Hebrews chapter 11, they had highs and lows. We only know about the good of Abel. None of his sin, I mean, he would have had to have sinned, but none of that's recorded. We only know about, all we know about him is he was righteous, he did the right thing, and he got killed. And so the writer of, he, uh, of Hebrews 11 starts with that as an example. Listen, I don't know how your life's going to unfold, and, and there's a pretty good chance that we're going to face trials and persecutions and difficulty. And there's going to be things we pray for. And we're like, God, if you'll just do these. And he, he isn't going to answer that because it's not his will or it's not the best thing for us in this life. But I, I just want to ha- have the long view. Have the long view. Be patient, enduring, hardship, difficulty. Even as, this, as the writer here starts with the worst case scenario, death, an unjust death. Whatever you have to face, do it with faith, knowing that God's keeping score. And the judge of all the earth will do what is right. There's an eternal reward that's waiting. Father, I pray that you'd help us to understand this. I pray that we would reorient the way that we think to look at the rewards of heaven, to look at the rewards of eternity and count them as greater than the experiences of this life. For this life is a shadow. It's a vapor. It'll pass quickly. Lord, for those who are here this morning, those among our congregation who have suffered injustice for doing what is right, or who may yet suffer injustice for doing what is right, Lord, I pray that they would have the confidence in knowing that you are keeping score, and you will reward faithfulness, just as you rewarded Abel, and he is still speaking to us today, even though he has been dead for many years. Lord, I pray that our example, when we are called to go through suffering, let our example speak to our children and our grandchildren and future generations, just as able to speaking to us today, we ask in Jesus' name.